us greater pleasure than to welcome a speaker into our midst who has done as much as our speaker tonight for telling the soldiers' stories. Many of you from the 83rd, the, the, the brothers in arms of the 83rd, you know Tony's story. So if you will allow me just for a moment, for those who are not familiar with, uh, with Tony's background, I'd like to, to read a little bit about him and I encourage all the rest of you to enjoy uh, Tony's uh, exhibition upstairs. Born in Greensburg, Pennsylvania in 1922, Tony Vaccaro was educated in both Italy and America. He bought his first camera in 1942 and one year later was drafted into the U.S. Army. Vaccaro was sent to Europe to join the Allied invasion of Normandy and soon found he preferred shooting with his camera rather than a rifle. His goal was to make a record of war's ugly brutality so that future generations would know what it was like. When he returned to America in 1949, Tony brought with him an outstanding portrayal, portrayal of World War II and its aftermath, one of the most comprehensive photographic diaries by any serviceman in any war. Upon his return to New York, Tony became chief photographer for Flair magazine and worked extensively for Look, Life, and Venture. His work has been exhibited worldwide. The government of France has awarded him the Legion of Honor and the Chevalier of Arts and Letters. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tony Vaccaro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I am here primarily uh, to discuss a little that took place at the Elbe River and beyond. First of all, I'd like to thank Colonel D'Alessandro uh, Michael Lynch and Colonel Retired Sweeney that so eloquently explained why these lectures are important. What is important about the 83rd Division is that by chance, I assume, uh, we were selected to make a special history Every war has something to look for, which is peace. Before we attain this peace, we must know what the objective is. And the objective of World War II was really Berlin. It so happens that we, being Americans, loving peace, loving democracy, we didn't think ahead. The Russians did. They made sure that we did not go beyond the Elbe River. At the Alta Conference of 1945, uh, February 4 and 11 at Yalta, they won the right and Roosevelt says, go ahead. You want us to stop at the Elbe? We'll stop at the Elbe. So did Churchill. That was a big mistake. Uh, prior to that date, our president, Roosevelt, took a map of Germany and he took a pen, a Mont Blanc pen, I understand, and uh, went 30 miles east of Berlin and he says, this is where I want the Americans to stop. But on that month, he was very ill. As you know, he died 50 days later. So he was weak, and the, the support personnel didn't help him. They should have fought for Berlin, because that was what we should have fought for. So when we arrived at the evening, the morning, early morning, of April 12, we arrived at the Elbe River. We actually arrived there at one o'clock at night, but we remained quiet. We didn't want to disturb the population of uh, Barbie, 
And if you see, I have a picture up there near a door where the Germans are looking at us, shocked that we are this close to Berlin. On that day, everyone was aware, why did we agree to end on the west bank of the Elbe? But we did. Somehow, during that day, our general, General Macon, received a phone call. Go beyond the Elbe, cross the Elbe River, and go on to Berlin. Now, this, of course, in a way, it is unethical. But in war, you do anything to win what you are doing. So on the morning of the 13th, the day that uh, our President Roosevelt died, we crossed the Elbe River, and we began the trek towards Berlin. I have photographs where you see uh, we can begin here. So you can see some of the photographs as we go along. The beauty of photography is that I suppose if you can play with it, you can tell a lie with a photograph. But if you do it with a camera and film, it tells the truth. And uh, the truth will come soon. You will see uh, photographs of the Elbe. Then you will see a sign that says, 61 kilometers to Berlin. And I have many of those signs that I can add to uh, this is where we are now, already at, at the West Bank. We are looking at the houses, the farms that go towards Barbie. And it's like between 6.30, this one is much later, as the first bridge. This is the Truman Bridge. We built two bridges across the river, Truman Bridge and Roosevelt Bridge. The Roosevelt Bridge was to transport uh, equipment, and the Truman Bridge was to transport soldiers to the front. The entire Second Armored Division held on wheels, and the entire 83rd Division crossed. And the first battle that we had, and you will see, it will, we will come to it, was just before Zerbst. Now, here is the, this was a late night when I, I took this bridge. It, this is also the Elbe at the narrowest point. And the reason why we chose the narrowest point is because huge trucks went over and we want to make sure that the bridge wouldn't be too long. So this is Roosevelt Bridge. This is the bridge that was closer to the first battle that we had, the Battle of Kameritz. Kameritz is famous for having a little school for uh, young boys. It's a military school. And when we arrived uh, closer to Kameritz, suddenly the firing is getting to be very heavy, and we answered. Uh, at a certain point after, I would say, two, three hours of fighting, some of you will remember, the firing from the enemy stopped. And we were able to advance and discover that we were shooting children. We must have killed two, three hundred children for the madness of a German instructor who told the children, get the guns and go fight the Americans. Uh, 
with dog in. That was an interesting picture before. And this is one of the first foxholes that we made east of the Elbe River. Uh, I went back as late as two years ago uh, with other 83rd. Mike, did you come back there to uh, Barbie? Uh, who came back uh, about four years ago? Wonderful. Now, what is interesting about going back there is that we went back hoping that we would find friends. The war is over, and we spoke, like I'm speaking here, very friendly. But the Germans somehow, not the local Germans, but the German military, they kept saying, we could have beat you. <laughs> I said, don't guess, just read history. It's old history now. So we took them to the bar and offered them beer. This is uh, east of the Elbe. A bullet went through his mouth. From right to left, took all his teeth out. And he was bleeding through the mouth, through underneath, along the skin, inside of the skin, inside of the, and it was dripping from the tip of the fingers, blood. So this, we fought east of the Elbe. I met someone today who told me that he was wounded there. Who is this gentleman? Is he here? Perhaps he's not here. So there are people who were wounded there. We lost many comrades. And here we are now, 40 miles from Berlin. This, way, this was the utmost that the division stopped. Now, if you remember the one picture that we have up here of a GI painted, his face painted black, that was taken on May 8, 1 o'clock in the morning, which means the night the night of the 7th of May. So at 1 o'clock, we're all made up dark. Do you remember that scene, Mike? Uh, lieutenant, Lieutenant, one of the lieutenants, he'll come to me, uh, gave orders to uh, reconnoiter the road from uh, this town called Hohenlepte and as close as we could come to Berlin. I was fortunate to go with a jeep on a road. We drove, it was all clear. We could have gone to Berlin because I found out the Germans were happy to surrender. They knew the Russians would be coming and they would not be as lenient as we are. So, why did, at that time, we receive the order to stop? At 40 miles from Berlin, we stopped. We followed the order, I assume, from Eisenhower, uh, at, at least from Eisenhower's office. And a few days later, the 13th of uh, May, we retreated west of the Elbe River. Now, what I am telling you here now, it's not in the history book. This is what has me mad, and this is why I am here speaking to you. Uh, one, I would recommend that we do something, all of us. You write a letter to our cliff. I would like them to write to the paper what happened to each person east of the Elbe River. We want to know, because I know that the future people, after we are gone, they want to know what did take place at the Elbe. So please write a letter. I was in Zerbs, I was in Hohenlepte, I was in this town, in that town, 
If you remember a story, write it. We need to do this. Uh, the Germans themselves, not the Germans, but the local people, they want that this war, World War II, has a real ending. And the ending is when World War II ended, the Russians were in East Berlin, the gates of East Berlin, and the Americans were at the west gate of Berlin, known as Charlottenburg. This must be done for our future generation. Uh, here, this is a photographer, a Russian photographer that I met, and later we had an exhibition together. His pictures of Berlin, I didn't take as many, and following this picture, there should be the catalog where the two of us uh, had this exhibition. A Russian photographer, Jujeni Kalde, from Moscow to Berlin, and an American photographer from New York to Berlin. And what you see in the background is when I flew over Berlin with an, an, an L reconnaissance plane that a friend of mine, Captain Valentine, was piloting. And he took me over Berlin. So, and here is the picture that was used as a background to that catalog. Unfortunately, I only have one left. And perhaps it will end up here. So this was what was left of Berlin. And they deserved it. They caused all the tragedy of mankind. And imagine what would have happened to this world if we had lost, if there was no America, because no one else in the world likes to do the dirty job of a cop. This is a German embracing his Hitler. This was taken by Jack Strauss, who also was in Berlin. Oh yes, there are about 10 photographs that are not mine here. Uh, here I wanted to show the old man that you see there at the bottom. He was 90 years old, and this young boy was 14 years old which means that from 14 to 90, the entire line of the male population of Germany was out fighting the war. And half of them had already been killed so that the future children of Germany, most of them 50% or less, had no father. Here is just a picture of Mickey Rooney visiting us this is Colonel York smoking. You, next to him is Jack Strauss with a Leica. Uh, this is the day that Mickey Rooney came to visit us. He's still alive and still humorous. Uh, here we are now looking at the Elbe. And this is Captain Patterson. On, on the left and on the right here is Captain Fleming of the 208 Field Artillery. Um, anyway, the, while well, the next picture is coming, uh, this is the press, uh, <laughs> Newsweek and Time Magazine together. <laughs> two enemies, a particular kind of enemies. And uh, they came to us and they said, you sure you are at the Elbe? And there is, you see in the back, Barbie. We are here south and the river is right there near the windshield that goes, the line goes across. Now we finished the Elbe. This is a picture of Normandy our approach to Normandy. 
Uh, I am showing here uh, some pictures of the war, and then I want to show you what happened to Tony after the war. There will be some movie stars, there will be some uh, fashion pictures, personality pictures, but this is the approach to Normandy. And this is as we begin our action. This was Ca Corporal Parrott from uh, North Michigan. He, he made the war. He got wounded, came back six months later, and they put him back again in the same unit. Uh, here you see an American doctor, uh, a German boy, 17 years old. He was almost seven, very tall, but his eyes had been taken away. He never saw again. And he was wounded by the Nazis' own booby traps, as he actually wanted to run away from the Nazis and come and give himself up. Many Germans. This was during the Battle of the Hurtgen Forest. This is also in the Hurtgen Forest. Uh, somebody, some other soldier, took his wallet and spread out these pictures of his family. Back home, there's his son, then a baby, and I suppose a wife. And there he is. They may be alive at home, and he's dead. This is... Uh, it's the, about 6 o'clock in the evening. Uh, now, for some reason, I went back to Autre, and this house is not there. Now, I could be wrong, but the picture was taken within Autre. And it's uh, PFC Jack W. Rose. I met him two weeks before. And he said something like Bronxville. And I thought he was from Bronxville, New York. I'm from New Rochelle next to each other. And it took me 60 years to find out that he was from Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> uh, this is a tank that came to, uh, to attack us. Now, the way I worked was this. Uh, my work primarily was for night. I went on night reconnaissance because I spoke few languages. And uh, this is the same soldier a week later. This is to show you what soldiers see and they think that they have been at war. This is five, six days after the first, when he actually died. And his last words were Muta. 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 And he was gone, just like that. Just like if, as if it was a film. Mother, mother, mother. That's his last words. I never heard anyone say father. Uh, we are here in the Hurricane Forest. Now, why did Eisenhower keep us in this forest for five months. It's four square miles. We bombed the most precious city in the world, Dresden. We, did, we obliterated it. Why didn't we obliterate the forest? We can always replant trees. I think there is a reason a reason that made us arrive late at the Elbe River. We purposely waited to let the Russian get closer to Berlin. We sort of chickened out. We got afraid that we would lose too many soldiers in taking Berlin. That's utter nonsense. We had so many B-17s we could have obliterated the whole country from the Elbe 
to Berlin. But we didn't do it. We waited five months in this forest, and we and the Germans lost 75,000 people. This is unheard of. Four square miles, five months. Just repairing. Somewhere about here, I want to entertain you because life is beautiful. The reason we fight is to have peace. And once we have peace, we must befriend the enemy. Believe it or not, the enemy have to become our best friend because ultimately we are all humans, humans forever. We may be, what, 90, 95% water, but it's precious water. The war is over. He's a New Yorker. I forgot his name now. He was in our headquarters company. When I look this way and I say, Mike, Mike cut from bone, stand up, Mike, please. He's a hero. <laughs> and he was at the Battle of Behain where we lost. Here I just show the mine. You see how you can step on that? And sometimes there is a little wire from one mine to another that you can trip and goodbye. You lose your feet, your life. I wanted to show you civilians how a mine looks like. And of course, now the war is over, and here is the statement by Eisenhower telling the Germans how to behave. I have one of those posters, and perhaps it will end up here too. By the way, I'd like to uh, point to attention to another person that I, it's a young man who comes here from Belgium. Please stand up, Wilson. There he is, <laughs> Brisbane. <Brisbane's laughs> and he knows the town Utrecht and the infamous battle of Behain where one single German got out of the fort. This is the first day of the occupation of Germany. Not one person is German is out. They're so afraid of us. Of course, anybody who wins that cruel war is scary. And here is that look at the Americans for the first time. My God, they are here. That's the first look at the Americans. I heard, I passed by that house at Barbie and I heard the squeaking opening and I turn around and click this expression. The war is over, Germany is recuperating and this is a new little store how it begins. He had no legs, he was cut, he had lost his legs. And it's in Frankfurt. This is now still 1940, the end of 45. And this is the symbol of war. It's not an enemy. She's a French girl. It was taken in Sambriac, Brittany. We had we have the distinction of liberating Brittany single-handed, the 83rd Infantry Division. The, uh, there was another group that tried to uh, help saving Elben, uh, Brittany, but they got into trouble and we had to help them out too. You know who I mean. I think it was called um, A. No, letter A, it was an, uh, the 
And this is the look that the Germans gave us. Look at that look. Hate, real hate for about three years. Very few were friendly towards us. But most of them gave us. This is in Liège, Belgium. Uh, it's now, we go back a little, it's Christmas uh, 1944. Uh, I had asked the newspaper La Wallonie in Liège if I could develop some of my films there. I was sick and tired of developing in a dark room, and in a, rather in a foxhole, and they did, and next door it broke, uh, a, a V2 destroyed that uh, house, and she was the only survivor. This was taken in Spain, uh, in the village that Picasso made famous with a painting called Guarnica. This boy was photographed in Guarnica 10 years after they had war there. And by the way, Guarnica was the first city in the world that uh, was bombed from the air and destroyed. These are the two people that I, I love them because they gave me all the help I needed, all the film I needed. And it's Colonel McDonald from Mississippi and uh, from Connecticut, Bud Fleming, giving him a haircut. Actually, he's faking. I was the barber. I was giving the haircut. <laughs> but he said, come, Tony, take a picture of me while I give a haircut. So I gave him the scissor and the thing. And this, we just capture these Germans. Uh, and right in front of me, he just said, Heil Hitler. And in English, I said, tomorrow. Heil Hitler. I, I am perhaps the only photographer who was able to do this. I was so fast. And here is the Battle of Behain. Now, this is a very interesting story. It's written in my book, but I'd like to tell it to you. Uh, I had been thinking uh, to honor a GI, a dead GI, symbolically. I didn't want to know the name of this GI. However, because I knew Mozart's Requiem, Verdi's Requiem, this is a sort of a comedy. Uh, he was our cook after the war. We were in parking. You remember parking? This was in parking, and he's, he wanted a card for his mother. And I said, what are you going to tell her? He says, hi, Ma. The war is over. I'm coming home. Now, I will finish what I was saying that before. Let's see what else we have here. Now, uh, years have passed. It's 1948. And this is the airlift to Berlin. This is my first Life magazine uh, assignment. And you see a C-54 landing with flowers, with uh, coal, with potatoes, with medicine, wh whatever, to, uh, for, the, for the people of Berlin. Because before the war, Hitler starved the entire population of Leningrad, which is known as St. Petersburg. And uh, this is part of the airlift and the story I just mentioned you. This is in a town called Celle, C-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, in Germany, which flew, and it was in the British zone. And Germany was divided in three zones, the British, the American, and the French. The French were south, we were in the center, and in the north were the British. And now I want to entertain you with some of the people. This is Somerset Maugham. You might have read his book of human bondage or perhaps seen a film of it. And I'm hiding behind the, the edge of the mirror. What I wanted to do here is to capture the personality of the individual. He was a very suave person. And this is, this is um, 
uh, Marcel Duchamp. He was a night person. He became alive like midnight and would go from one bar to another to a club. And I spent one evening doing a story on him, and it's taken right under a lamp, 14th Street and 6th Avenue in New York. Marcel Duchamp, he is the one who created that great, uh, the new, the descending, the stairs, a very triple exposure. This is the Shah of Iran. Uh, I spent uh, two weeks in Tehran doing a story on him. I didn't think he was too bright. Uh, in fact, uh, he, uh, he got kicked out. And of course, we have a worse Iran than he had. This is Nixon. I think he could have been a nice, and he was a good father. But I didn't think he would be a good president. This was before he was a president. This is the trouble with America. There are people running for the presidency, and we don't have a clue what kind of people they are. We are the country that's supposed to have the freedom to say the truth. I am not happy right now who I am to vote for. And I should not be in this situation. This is, he would agree with me. This is Bertrand Russell. I asked him here, do you think mankind will have a permanent forever and always peace? And he's thinking. And he says, never. Because man has not even learned a simple lesson that Socrates told us. Know thyself. Three words. Know thyself. We have not yet learned that. We don't know what the hell we are. Are we Christians? Are we Jews? Are we Americans? Are we Russians? Are we Japanese? What are we? We better learn fast because we have enough material out there that could obliterate us. Frank Lloyd Wright, I love him. He was completely the opposite of what the press told me. They made him like the son of a bitch. He was one of the sweetest men I've ever met and the most intelligent that I ever met. Maybe that's what the press was jealous of, <laughs> that he was too smart. This is the painter de Kooning. We were great friends. Just before his death, he told me why we were great friends. He always came into my studio. Oh, I didn't tell you. I will tell you later. But uh, he came into my studio whenever I was photographing fashion models. And I know, he finally told me, he says, you didn't know it, but I was dating all your girls. <laughs> And this, I wanted you to show that once you know how to do war pictures, you can get these kind of pictures that no photographer has been able to do. Get the blood out of a bull. Because if you see and click, that's too late. You have to do it when you don't see it. And you click because that time element is that spurt of the blood which is slightly less than a second. And this is one of the men that I also love and found very intelligent and profound with humanity, Dmitry Shostakovich. If you never heard of him, go anywhere. Don't co records don't cost much. Buy his fifth symphony and listen to it. And then perhaps you can buy his ninth symphony where with music, he tells the story of how that jackass of Hitler destroyed the entire population of Leningrad. This is Jackson Pollock. It was slightly tinted when I printed this picture.
this is also a great man, uh, Le Corbusier, one of the great architects. I place him next to Frank Lloyd Wright. Not next, a little below. He was a little arrogant, a little French, you know. Actually, he's, he's Swiss, but the French part of Switzerland. But he did come up with something that measure of everything is man. Mankind is the measure of everything. This is Giorgio De Chirico, an Italian painter. Uh, so what you are seeing here now is I came back to New York after the war, went back to live in New Rochelle, my hometown, and uh, I saw a magazine called Flair. I didn't like life anymore. This is from uh, a story I did, but this is how I photographed the pyramids. I wanted to show pyramids through time, so to speak, my interpretation. Sometimes you look at things and things tell you how they want to be photographed. And this is what the pyramids told me to do while I was looking at them. The same here. The selling here are eyeglasses. You barely see the eyeglasses, but it's a commercial for sunglasses. I, I don't mean eyeglasses, sunglasses. By day, sunset, and by night should be following. So I came out of the war, I came to New York, and I go to Flair, and this is by night, also the sunglasses. And she looks at my book, this uh, editor of Flair, and she said, uh, these are combat pictures. I don't need a combat photographer. I need a fashion photographer. Can you take fashion pictures? What could I do, lose a job or take a job? I wanted a job. And now, to take the job, I had to lie. So I lied. I said, of course, I took fashion pictures in Normandy. <laughs> uh, this is Ursula Andres. While she was making, it's not under, it's Andres with an A, with an A. And uh, when she was making the film, Dr. No, of uh, James Bond, have you seen anyone that film? It's a great film. Here she is. Ursula Andres. I took that day about, I couldn't let her go out of my sight. So I took uh, like five, six hundred pictures like this. <laughs> and this is a picture that its head is sharp and everything is blurred. And this is what I told the model. I want you to stand at attention like a soldier, which I did many times. I got to show this to you. I, I told her, stand at attention, then you go up in the air, you go down and you jump up, and as you arrive at the top, bring out the legs out and arms out. And that's how she did it. The second try, we succeeded. So when you are a photographer, your brain rings with ideas. And I wanted to illustrate that fact. And I think we have come to the end of the show. Uh, I want to say a few more things. <laughs> Why I became a photographer. Oh, George O'Keefe. I loved her. She was superb. Great lady. She hated me when I arrived in Santa Fe, New Mexico in a Madison Avenue gray suit, you know, polished. Uh, and for five days, she didn't want to see me, no picture. Oh, by the way, Frank Lloyd Wright also, three, four days, no pictures, no pictures. This is my wife, photographed with separated light. Light, as you know, is made of three primary colors. So what I did was three equal lights, but a primary color in front of each one, 
to create complementary colors in the shadows because the shadows, the lights were apart. They go on a phase together, forming light. But in the back, they are separated. Here, I wanted to show you that women sometimes have no gravity. They just fly away from you. <laughs> this was for good housekeeping. Joanna was her name. This involves three exposures to create this scene. And uh, it was taken in Rome. Uh, but there is one next one that I like very much. I think it's next where the same animal uh, moves only the head but not the body, and it's interesting. Uh, well, these are models. Uh, this is, uh, was done in Helsinki. This was for Life magazine, and the fashion was Marimekko. And uh, as I was driving to Helsinki, I saw this black earth and I took the models there, so they are one, two, three, four, five exposures here. And that's that picture I was talking together. Uh, you see the same bird, the left side of the face and the right side of the face. With photography, you can do incredible things. Just let your brain wander and become a child. The beauty of some of the greatest men I ever met uh, were those who were able to talk like children. This is another story called Close to Say Goodbye With. And the idea was that she had an affair with this man she just got out of the plane and still in last night's gone, it's early morning, she's running to her place before her husband. It's just fantasy. <laughs> now this is really the last picture. Uh, there is a death, you see the hearse? This is a church, there's a column of a church there's a mess going on. Some of the men, of course, don't like that. But the little girl is announcing the future. That's what I see in this picture. Charming. The dog. Sometimes everything takes place so beautiful. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you have uh, questions for uh, Tony, as I said, if you're able, please uh, use the, the microphone right here in the center. As a matter of fact, we'll move it a little bit closer. If you can't get to the microphone, then raise your hand, and, uh, and we'll try to get it around to you. Travis, you okay? All right, questions for Tony. cry. I literally cry under the enlarger. 
When I place the negative in the enlarger, the negatives are, you know, 35 millimeters, very small. But I place the negative in the enlarger and then I go up and the bigger, the picture becomes bigger, bigger and bigger and I decide, well, let's do it here. And I remember the situation takes me there. I cry. There is no other way. Um, when I tell certain stories in a situation like today, I have given many lectures in my life. And when I come to a situation where I remember the last words of a GI, or even a Frenchman and a German. I saw a Frenchman dying. I saw and heard. I saw a German dying and I heard. And I saw Americans, many dying and I heard. And for some reason it was always mother, mother. Uh, in mid, uh, towards the end of July, in Normandy, there was a truck loaded with German prisoners and French people from the east part of Normandy. And uh, I was awakened by uh, 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 George Nichols from Alabama, one of us. And he says, Mike, my name is, you know, is Michel Antonio Vacca, Michel Antonio, so it's a long name. In the army, I was known by the first name, but that's uh, another story. Maybe I should tell it to you. Uh, Mike, uh, there is a truck of prisoners being taken back to the Nazis, and then they will dismount, and we will fill it up with they are all wounded, and then we will go to the German side. We will fill up the truck and bring them back here. But they need you to translate in French, explain this to the French people. Uh, so I uh, went, I got in the truck, and the only room that they had was in the back with all these wounded soldiers. And they were all saying, Mutter, Mama. And sometime that was the last time they said it. We lost a couple of people being transported. That's how wounded they were. And then when we came back, many American soldiers, perhaps in the same situation, but no one did say anything. I have a hunch ours came back alive and they remain alive, hopefully. Was anybody wounded on that trip by any, by any chance? Towards the end of July, we exchanged wounded. It was the Germans who got in touch with us. We have some of you wounded, we would like to give it back to you. And if you can return are wounded, and this took place. Any other question? After I took that, the picture of uh, Rose, I had to go and call guard at the headquarters in Petit Langlier, where we discussed this Wilfred, last evening. Uh, so I, uh, and I had to be there by seven o'clock. The guard changed, I took over, and it's snowing, and it's night. About one o'clock in the morning, I was still there pacing in front of the headquarters of this house, and it's still there. Uh, I hear something, and uh, it's snowing heavy, and I said, Alt, who's there? 
and he said, Mike is Schumacher. And as soon as he said that, I knew that something was wrong for two reasons. I suspected that Schumacher, something was wrong with him because the same thing took place uh, about two months before during the battle of uh, Gay. Uh, after we completed the taking of the Hurricane Forest, the first town was called Gay, not G-A, but G-E-Y, Gay. And, uh, and the same thing, he took his platoon and he came back alone. And here is again, he came back alone. And I said, w what happened? And he said, uh, well, we, uh, we went into battle. We arrived just about 100, 200 yards to the forest, and the Germans let us have it. Uh, maybe one or two were dead, but most of us were alive. A single German at about one, between one and two in the morning of January 11 and 12, uh, a single German came out of the forest dressed white with a white sheet. This is what he was telling me. I'm quoting him. And he went to every GI that was screaming for help and put a bullet in the brain. And uh, when he arrived to me, he kicked me. I made believe I was dead. They took my wallet. They took my watch. And that's the story. Uh, and somehow, this thought of a photographic requiem came back to me. Maybe in the snow, there could be a good photographic picture. So I said, well, could you take me to the spot as early as possible? Let's say 6 o'clock in the morning. Can you take me there? So Schumacher took me there, and, uh, and I see all the GIs dead, one here, here. Blood was all over. Um, and and uh, I am now shocked by this. I had forgotten about the picture that I wanted. And I see this GI the way he was. And, and, and I wanted to see uh, who he was. And I am about to step in the snow. And I said, no, Tony, this is your requiem. So I stepped back. I took one picture. But I made a mistake. I took my bayonet. I went to the snow. The snow was icy. After the snow, it became very cold, and it was icy. So I chipped away, and I discovered that it was Henry S. Tannenbaum, Private Tannenbaum of Brooklyn. He was one of my friends. And now what was that you asked before? I am at the verge of crying. Why this happens? We are humans. So this is the story. 50 years later, I get a phone call. And he said, are you Tony Vaccaro who took this picture? I said, yes. My name is Sam Tannenbaum. I knew immediately I burst into tears because I, I liked that Tannenbaum. We had a few. He actually stayed with us about a month and a half. He was a replacement. He showed me the picture of his wife and this one child. And it was this one child who now was 51. And he called me and he said, uh, well, if you are that Tony Vaccaro, could you please tell me exactly where my father was killed. And I said, well, 
I am being honored in the town of Wilfred, the capital, near, uh, yes, yes. Uh, Versalm was the, the big city nearby. Uh, they honored me four or five years ago. Uh, and I said, I can take you there. So we went there and we couldn't find this, I couldn't find this place. It was so simple. So I keep walking, keep walking, keep walking. And then I see uh, a wire fence and I said, this is it. So I follow the wire fence and it takes me into a forest. Uh, so I asked the man who took me there, do you know the owner of this land? He says, oui, monsieur. So he said, I'll go get him for you. He went nearby. About 20 minutes later, he came back. Meantime, I was still looking for this spot. And, uh, and I, asked, I showed, I had the photograph with me. I said, this picture was taken here. It must have been, uh, uh, a Whitfield, and he said, "My we miss you, it was a Whitfield. I said, why is it a forest? And he said, this is not a forest. These are Christmas trees that I sell in uh, Portugal and Spain every winter. And then I asked him, do you know what Tannenbaum means in German? And he said, je ne sais pas, monsieur. I said, it means Christmas trees. Can you imagine that? Christmas trees were growing where this man died. Now, I learned last night from Wilfred that once again, there are no trees there. So that's the story of Tannenbaum. In, nine, in the year 2000, the Time magazine of Germany, which is called Der Zeit, the Time, Zeit is time in German, uh, asked its uh, subscribers, uh, we're going to be printing some of the greatest photographs ever taken, and please vote for the picture you like the best. Tannenbaum was named in Germany. Can you imagine that? The enemy was named the greatest photograph of the 20th century, that picture, because of the feeling it gave. Any other questions? Uh, Tony is very special to us. Uh, because of Mr. Tannenbaum, but also because three years ago, after 63 years of looking, I found the only man who ever knew my father, and that was you. And you remembered him, and you remembered his picture. That was in Normandy. Yes, and we were in Nashville together, and you told me who he was, and where he was, and what he was like, and that after the middle of July, you never saw him again, and you were absolutely right. So I found the other half of him. I had the first half from my family and the rest from you, and I will always be grateful for that. And I'd like to know, Tony, the pictures that you have in the gallery. There is one from the 2nd Battalion Headquarters Company upstairs, yes. men sitting around in Germany, and I don't remember exactly the title, but I saw it today, and I wondered if you had the names of those men, perhaps, in that picture that I might know, and maybe some of them might still be alive and know him as well. Maybe after we go together, take a look. Uh, yes, Georgia. Obviously, um, to everyone here, by fate, by mission, you photograph with your heart. I think I would like to know, is there any event or any person you wish you had photographed? Oh, yes. Uh, there are many. Einstein is one of them. 
Uh, unfortunately, magazines had an agreement that Jewish people would photograph Jewish people and my kind of people would be photographed by, by me. And that is why I didn't go there. Uh, they sent me to the, to the uh, Arabian countries, to the Muslim countries. They sent me to Saudi Arabia. I spent one week with Nasser in, in uh, Egypt doing a great story on him. Um, oh, there's so many. But so many I have photographed who I wanted to photograph because uh, I was one who suggested a lot of ideas to editors. I discovered that the more ideas you suggested to editors, the more assignments you would have. And I photographed about a thousand personalities of the 20th century. Uh, Picasso, he asked me to go photograph him. That's... <laughs> Uh, once I had an appointment with um, Sophia Loren, Lux Soap got in touch with me and said, uh, we know that you are a good friend of Sophia Loren. Uh, and that's because in 1953, Life magazine sends me to uh, Rome, Italy, to be their foreign correspondent photographer in Rome. Um, I arrived in Rome. Now, in New York, at that time, I had a penthouse, and I fell in love with penthouses because I have a, not one green thumb, I have two green thumbs. I just love to put my hands in the earth and do something with them. So, and it was a beautiful penthouse. So, I... Uh, rented Sublis, this penthouse, and I went to Rome and I said, Tony, you check yourself into an hotel and stay there till you find a penthouse. So every day I would look uh, for rent in the Italian papers, the American paper, the Rome Daily American, and I would just go to apartments and sure enough, within a month, there was an apartment, penthouse, Piazza Bologna, a little outside of Rome, but I don't care, I wanted a penthouse, so I went. I went there, and it was a small place about like this, very small, very small. But the, the terrace, I would say, within two, three feet, it was as big as this room. And I said, wow, I can have my own forest here. <laughs> so, uh, two, three days later, so my things are in this little room. My portfolios with my photographs, the best of my work. And so, two, three days later, the, cons the owner of this building tells me, says, Signor Vaccaro, you are a photographer of women. And I say, si, signora, sono un fotografo di donne. I am a photographer of women. Ah, but you should meet Sofia. I never heard Sofia before. So about a month later, I got an assignment from the New York office and said, Tony, we need a new Italian beauty. Find one for us. That's the telegram. I still have in my book of famous papers. And so I walk all over Rome. I go to the best cafes, the best nightclubs. I just don't see any face that I like. So a month goes by, I get another telegram. Where is this Italian beauty, Tony? Get going. So I keep looking, keep looking, and then I couldn't stand anymore, and I go back to this lady, and I said, who is this Sophia? 
Do you know how I can get in touch with her? She says, I will get in touch with her. So she got in touch, she got the phone, I called this Sophia, and I met Sophia Loren. We became very good friends. She was not yet 19, and she was so beautiful. So now, about uh, four, four years later, this Lux Soap calls me about Sophia. And I had to tell you that I knew her. So we make an appointment 10 o'clock at my studio, at my penthouse studio. So unfortunately, that morning I had another job to do. With three models, I was doing dresses in Central Park. The apartment, the penthouse was on Central Park. This time is in New York. And uh, I did the fashions in Central Park between 7 and 9 o'clock, two hours. I gave the film to my assistant, who took it to the office of Look Magazine. And I ran to my uh, studio to meet Sophia at 10 o'clock. At about 9.20, I was at my studio, and I said, I have time for a shower. So I go in the shower, and uh, as I step out of the shower, wet and rich for the towel, the bell rings. And it's now 9.35. I said, Sophia is never early. She's always late. So I put a towel around me. I opened the door, thinking that it was the uh, elevator man with the daily mail, with the mail, and there is Sophia Loren. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, here is my door. She's, she steps back and looks at me from the toe to the head and says, Tony Vaccaro, sempre pronto, always ready. proceedings to a close tonight, if you could just share with our audience, many of them have been friends of yours for 60 years, but many others have not heard the fascinating story about how you came to be in the Army and all of your, all of your, your story beforehand. Uh, shall we call this, how did a nice Italian boy like you end up in a place like this? <laughs> well, I was born in Pennsylvania in Greensburg. It's about an hour drive east of Pittsburgh. At the age of three, I was taken to Italy in the village where my father and my mother were born. And uh, they went there with three of us. I have two sisters. Uh, Gloria is the eldest. Unfortunately, she passed away two years ago. I was in the middle, and uh, Sue is um, in New York now, healthy. And uh, we arrived there so that my parents could introduce me to their parents, my grandparents. Uh, we did that, and uh, I remember it was a wonderful life. Unfortunately, my father had to leave us there, come back here to work, and we were supposed to go back uh, about a month later but my mother died. She caught an infectious disease that a simple pill today would cure her, but in those days, they didn't have penicillin, and she died. So my father said, well, they're babies, he explained to my grandmother. Uh, how about if I come back in three years and pick them up? I was three, uh, Gloria was five and a half, and Sue was two years old. So in March of 1928, my father came back, 
and we were to leave the first week of July that same year, 1928. And uh, on the, the uh, first or second of June, he went to visit his brother on our farm about an hour away from the village. He loved to walk, and I wish he had walked. But uh, his sister-in-law insisted that he rides a mule. Uh, he refused, and he, they go on another 15 minutes, and she insisted, come on, Joe, get, get on the mule. And eventually he gave in, he got on the mule, and he didn't go too far. The story I heard is that a black snake crossed the street, crossed the path uh, of the mule. The mule jumped and kicked my father off. Now, what had taken place there a few days before, when uh, after, at spring, the trees grow and they narrow the path. And what the farmers do, they just cut these young trees, you know, and my father happened to fall on one of those that went right through him, and he died of cancrene shortly after that. So we got marooned, the three of us, again in Italy, till one day uh, I hear that there is World War I going on, and a week after that, I received the telegram of the American ambassador to my name, uh, Michel Antonio Vaccaro, you are urged to return immediately to America. If you do not have money, we will supply the money. And so on, on Thanksgiving Day of 1939, I arrived in New York, only to be sent back three years later, fight a war. Now, how did I become a photographer? It's interesting, if you like to know. When uh, I uh, grew up alone in Italy, uh, I didn't like what they were teaching me. They were teaching me to be a fascist, but I knew I was an American, and I was fighting for it. Uh, and because of this, I was constantly being, constantly being punished for not accepting fascism. Um, I got even, by the way, with those teachers when I went back later <laughs> as a civilian with the rank of a colonel. I didn't tell you that. I had the job with stars and stripes as a civilian. They had the equivalency to a colonel. So I had the uniform of a colonel. Uh, anyway, uh, when uh, I realized that um, I was to leave Italy soon, I got a camera to photograph all my young friends. And that's how I began to like photography. Uh, but the thing th that is important when a child grows up all alone without parents is that I literally, I was left alone. And uh, I didn't like the school, Italian school. But I liked an uncle that I had. He was a barber. And in this barber shop, he had three or four or five magazines, five, six, seven newspapers for clients to read, you know, barber shops. And from the age of five, I ate those papers. Literally, I read them from cover to cover so that my school in Italy was in this barber shop, not in the school. So I uh, wanted to become, uh, before I say that, what touched me the most was a particular correspondent. Uh, some of you remember Ernie Pyle, well, this Italian journalist was a kind of an Italian Ernie Pyle. He was covering the Japanese Manchurian China War. And his, his uh, 
communicate, communicates were very short but so humanly written that I wanted to become a foreign correspondent. I said, when I grow up, I want to be a foreign correspondent. So then comes the war, then comes the, the, the telegram from the American ambassador, the boat to America, the Thanksgiving, and I am now in America, and I tell the story to my home room teacher, Bertram L. Lewis. And he said I, to me one day, Tony, what would you like to be in life? What do you want to do? And I said, well, for all my life, I wanted to be a foreign correspondent but as you can see, my English is very poor. I had forgotten most of it. And he looks at me with a smile, so I knew he had something. And he said, Tony, how about foreign correspondent photographer? And that was it. And that's why I became a photographer. Now, why are my pictures? By the way, last year, England, BBC London made a movie, The History of Photography, and I am named the best war photographer, the 83rd. Thank you. It took the Brits to do it. <laughs> now, uh, here is what I want to tell you. You are famous all over Europe. I donated France 350 pictures of my best work. I donated England, and they're all the 83rd. It's out there, all these pictures that I'm continuously donating. The picture that you see up there will never leave this room. They keep it here. So, and it's only because I love that job, but I didn't do it for love. I did it for spite. And here is how it happened. When I was in camp, camp uh, Mississippi, Camp Van Dorn, with the 63rd Blunt Guts Division, uh, my captain said, uh, Tony, we know that you are a photographer. Why don't you apply to be transferred to the Signa Corps? And uh, I said, sure, Captain Patterson. So he came out with a form. A captain recommended me. Tony is a great photographer. It's a waste to have him in the infantry. He should be in the, you know, he said some nice words. And so I got a letter back from the Signa Corps saying, we regret, but you are too young for us. Now, here I am in the army. I am good enough for this. I am old enough for that but I am not old enough for this. <laughs> now, I, I thought I was so stupid. <laughs> and I said to myself, write home, have them send me my camera, I'm gonna go through the war, and I'm gonna take the best pictures of the war, and at the end of the war, I'm gonna do this to the <laughs> Signa Corps. And now those pictures have been named the best pictures of the war. <laughs> so, but after the war, I tried to find that letter and I couldn't find who knows where my sister put it because I wanted to find out that individual who answered to me, you are too young for us to do just what I symbolically did with my hand now to him but I never found him. I never had that satisfaction. 
But in a way, he did make me so mad, and that is why they are great photographs. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> was that okay? That was okay. Thank you. <laughs> you didn't tell the rose story. That's a beautiful story. Oh, yes. Tony, if you yeah. can join us over here for just a second. Yes. All of you know that we here at the Army Heritage and Education Center live for one thing, and that is to tell the Army story for one soldier at a time. What a great soldier we've heard from tonight. And it's not just a great soldier we've heard from, but a great soldier who's reported history for all of us, the history that many of you in this room made. Many of us will experience World War II through the eyes of Tony's camera. Nobody who's seen Tony's work can fail to be affected by it. I think all of us are, are very pleased with what Tony's done, but we're also very thankful. Tony, on behalf of Colonel Rob D'Alessandro and the entire staff of the Army Heritage Education Center, we'd like to oh. present you with this souvenir oh. of your, uh, your talk tonight. This is Tony's poster that you saw out in the, uh, out in the lobby, and thank you very much.